Thank you for joining me today. Today I want to talk briefly about Chinwe Zhu, the Nigerian poet and critic, and his work on Ariel and Caliban, especially how he mobilizes these two characters from Shakespeare's The Tempest in order to theorize two kinds of post-colonial native subjectivities. Now, before we go into Chen Wei Zhu's theorization of it, of course, you are probably familiar with Shakespeare's uh, The Tempest, which usually is considered his last play. But the narrative or the story in that is that Prospero is, a, is a, an Italian noble who was evicted from his power and he is stranded on this island uh, with his daughter Miranda. And he has two subjects who in a way serve him. One is Ariel and the other is Caliban. Now throughout the play, Ariel is represented as this magical but subservient servant whose relationship to Prospero is sort of contractual because Prospero has promised Ariel that after his services are complete, he will be set free. Caliban, on the other hand, traditionally was referred to or represented or staged as something less than human, something brutish. He's called such names within the play. But surprisingly, uh, after Prospero, he seems to have a lot of dialogue in the play and also seems to make the most logical argument for his right to the island in one of the scenes. Now, Chin Wei Zhu picks these two characters up and his argument is that after the colonizers leave, there are two kinds of natives who are left behind, the Ariels and the Calibans. The Ariels, according to Chen Wei Zhu, were the natives, probably the native elite, who were educated in the Western institutions, who worked in the colonial administration, and more and less think of the world and think of their own nation states or nations with the same worldview and within the same framework as the colonizers. And they are the ones who mostly inherit the post colonies, the post colonial nation states that come into being. Calibans, on the other hand, are majority of the native people within the post colonial nation state. These are your workers, your peasants, people who may not have been educated either in the Western educational system or within their own native educational system. And their condition doesn't change much. They were poor under the colonial rule and disenfranchised. And that's the situation that they find themselves in. Now, bear in mind that Chin Wei Zhu believes in retrieving a certain pure African identity. Now, I don't know whether it's possible or not, but that's his project. So for Africa, when he's theorizing about these two human subjectivities within the post colonies, his argument is that in order to really construct viable African national and international cultures, the Africans must first retrieve their own original cultures. And when he mentions the original cultures, his idea is that Africans should first erase all the Arab influence, hence the Islamic influence, because that was the first wave of a different kind of pre-capitalistic -colon pre colonization of Africa. And then they must also remove the European influences, especially the influences that are destructive. Now, he's not necessarily a nativist because what he wants to suggest in his book, Decolonizing the African Mind, is that Africans must rethink their own individual national and pan-national identities within an industrial system of imagining the world. So he doesn't want to go back to a pastoral African past, a pre-industrial past, but that in the process of doing so, the Africans people and nations must Africanize these knowledges, must make them indigenous. So in that process, the aerialized natives, the natives who were incorporated within the logic of the colonial enterprise, Chin Wei Zhu sees them as a hurdle because their sympathies in his view, both symbolic, cultural, material, are not necessarily with the people of the nation states, the post-colonial nation states, but they are still aligned with their former European masters. 
because they are a pro they are a product of that culture, that educational system, and their sensitivities also are aligned with the Europeans. So for Chinwezu, for Africa and African nations to really recover and reconstruct an African mode of existence, but also an African mode of production, the rule of Ariel must end. That's what he says. The rule of Ariel must end and Caliban must take his or her original place in that culture as the dominant figure, if not necessarily the dominant figure, as the figure who has more rights on the resources of the nation state or, or the nation itself. So he reads these two characters as two human subjectivities created under colonialism. Now, if you go back to Shakespeare's The Tempest, if you look at the Ariel Caliban Prospero relationship, uh, the reason Ariel owes his allegiance to Prospero is because Prospero frees Ariel. Ariel had been encased in a tree trunk by Cycorex, the previous owner of the island. And when um, Prospero comes, he frees Ariel and in return, Ariel promises to serve him. And in order to serve him, Ariel does anything that Prospero tells him to do. And Ariel has magical powers. So he puts those magical powers at the service of Prospero. But Ariel also occasionally reminds Prospero that remember your words, you know, what you had promised me that after you're done with this island, after I have served you enough, you will free me. So Ariel's relationship with Prospero is based in service, but with the problems of freedom. Now, psychologically speaking, what Chen Wei Zhu is then suggesting is that does Ariel really become free? after Prospero leaves, because for so long, Ariel has functioned within the logic of power that Prospero created. Similarly, Arielized natives, natives whose sensitivities, politics, and a sense of history and the present is shaped by European colonization, European educational systems, European uh, symbolics. Is it possible for them to leave all that baggage and become you know, native citizens of a post-colonial state. Kaliman, on the other hand, in so many ways, if you pick him up from the play, he's a defiant figure. You never see him in the play actually giving his consent to Prospero. He obeys Prospero because of the power of Ariel, because he's punished, because he has no way of overthrowing Prospero. And a number of times in the play, he plans to overthrow Prospero and fails. Now, in the earlier staging of the play, maybe that was seen as comical or maybe that was seen as an ineffectual move by a less than human being. But in post-colonial readings and in more enlightened readings of it, that is the resistant native. That is the native who constantly keeps trying to overthrow his master. Now, when Chen Wei Zhu suggests that the reign of Ariel must come to an end and Caliban must take possession of his or her heritage, I don't think so. He means literally that all, all the Ariels should be wiped out. The idea is that the preferences and the rights of the area, of the Calibans of the post-colony, of those who have been left behind, those uh, who fought hard for the freedom but never got to enjoy the fruits of that freedom, because those fruits uh, were appropriated by aerialized natives, that they must finally have a place, a central stage in the nation state. And hence, that is how he theorizes these two competing uh, human subjectivities that are constructed out of the colonial experience. And he's not very far from the actual existing living conditions in the post-colonial world, if you look at any post-colonial nation, India, Pakistan, nations in Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, you see that the elite, the governing elite, the economic elite most of the times is the elite that is, uh, you know, Europeanized, that is, uh, that relies on their international connections. And while people, Adivasis in India, the tribals in Pakistan, are pretty much outside of the dispensation and promise of the nation state itself. Uh, 
So on the whole, I think Jin Wei Zhu's idea or theorization of these two human subjectivities is still pertinent and it applies to most post-colonial nation states. And, 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 and the idea is to create policies and to create actions that enable Ariel to become part of the national mainstream, not only in terms of distribution of resources, but also to become someone who sets the agenda of the nation. Because if the agenda of the nation is set by those who have the least, chances are the nation state would then become attentive to what it must do to include more and more of the people, the Taliban-like people who have been left behind during the march of progress in the post-colony can become part of the nation. And that is his project, at least he thinks it at the level of the nation, but also at the level of the African culture itself. And maybe it applies to all post-colonial nation states and post-colonial nations where those who have been silenced, those who are the subalterns and who have often been represented by an elite, a Europeanized elite, maybe the idea is to bring them to the central stage and then set the agenda, the national agenda, the national development agenda with their interests in mind and not the interests of the aerialized natives. So these are some of the words that I had to say about Chen Wei Zhu's theorization of aerial and Caliban. Uh, I would love to answer any questions. If you have, please post them in the comments below. And if you like these videos and if you would like to be part of our weekly um, live webinars, please do subscribe at the bottom and send me your questions if you have any through postcolonial.net. My email is there or you can just post a comment on any of the blogs. Thank you so much for joining me and goodbye.